Hey, Meeple people, and on today's vlog, we're playing Deep State, A New World Order by Crowd D Games. Let's get into it. It is the 20th century, the century of skyrocketing technological development and new economic and political relations, the century of two world wars and several revolutions, the century of changing ideals. In the 20th century, it became possible for the first time to create a single world government. You oversee a subdivision in a secret and powerful organization, the committee. Its goal is to become that government. As head of the subdivision, you deploy an agent network all over the world and covertly seize the sources of power. To achieve your goals, you co-opt influential societies, both well-known and secretive. From political parties and financial groups to research centers and powerful structures, they're all just puppets operated by masterful hands. One must know how to pull the right strings. Even the committee itself is just a stepping stone on your path. However, there are other subdivisions in the committee and their leaders are equally capable and ambitious as you. Remember, there can be only one puppet master in the puppet world. Hey, Meeple people, and hello, Sarah. Hi there. So what game are we playing on today's vlog, Sarah? Today we're going to be playing Deep State New World Order from Crowd or Crow D Games. Um, this is a one to five player game that they've sent us for the channel. Thank you so much. Uh, would you like to know a little bit about how to play? Yes, please. All right. So in this game, we are attempting to create a new world order and one that hopefully we are on top of when all things are said and done. Uh, and the way that that's going to look is that we are going to be acquiring these cards right here. Um, and these cards are going to give us points. They're going to give us some icons that will trigger other sort of events and that kind of thing. Um, and we will be using these cards in order to sort of um, burrow our way further into the new world order and we can do that by um, sort of uh, climbing through the ranks of these sort of um, uh, hidden organizations um, that can help us to further our agendas um, and we can also do it by uh, accumulating um, resources and things that are going to allow us to play um, sort of like secret objective cards, which will gain us more points and abilities. Um, so the way that it works in a two player game is that at the start of the game, one player is going to be the start player, and that's going to be me for this game. The very first thing that the start player does on their turn is they take two agents from their reserve and they put them into their active pool. Um, now these are agents that I can use to attempt to gain cards or join the different um, organizations down here or that kind of thing. The next thing that the active player can do is they can either attempt to take over one of these cards right here or they can attempt to uh, acquire one of these cards right here. These are really simple. You just need this number of uh, meeples in order to acquire them. And at the end of the game, they're worth a certain number of points. So those are really simple. Basically, you just spend the required meeples in order to get them. Um, but these cards over here, uh, in order to get these, I have access to the first three cards in the row right now, so I can choose any one of these three cards that I want. Um, and I'm going to need to pay at least this number of meeples. So if I wanted this card right here, I'd have to pay at least three of my meeples. If I wanted this one or this one, I'd only have to pay one, but I could pay more if I want to. Uh, so let's pretend that that's what I do. Let's say that I go here, for example. Uh, I've just put one meeple on this card. Now, as long as nobody else pays more than I do for this card right here by the end of the round, then I will acquire this card and I'll get to add it to my tableau. It'll score me a point at the end of the game if I still have it by then. And it will get me one of these icons right here, which I may use to get into one of these organizations or trigger special uh, scoring conditions or uh, abilities on other cards. Or meet like treaty conditions too. Exactly. So what's going to happen next is will be Nick's turn. Um, on Nick's turn, he has the same options that I did. He can attempt to take one of these cards right here. He can go to one of the three cards over here. Or because he is not the start player for this round, he also has two additional options. He can start to infiltrate one of these organizations right here. And the way that he would do that is he would start with the um, the very first stage, right? So if he wanted to do this one here, he would just have to spend two of his workers to be able to do that. Um, if the, he wanted to do this one here, it would only cost one. Um, if he wanted to do this one here, however, it would cost a worker and it would cost icons from cards that he had previously collected. 
Um, and some of these other ones require that as well. For example, uh, this one, it just costs one to go there for the first stage, but if you wanna move into the next stage right here, you have to spend two workers and you have to have this icon uh, in cards that you've previously collected. Now, for Deep State, you actually have to discard those cards, but for Unified Nations and this one right here, you actually just have to have them. Uh, and then spend the workers to be able to move through the ranks of this one here. Um, these each give you different abilities that you can use. Um, sometimes it's a one-time use ability, sometimes you use throughout the game. Um, and basically they're going to give you those abilities and if you can progress through the sort of levels of these um, so that you get high enough up the ranks, you'll also be able to score some points at the end of the game. So if, for example, uh, I start with this sort of like level one area right here, and then throughout the game, I'm able to rank up. Um, let's say I get all the way to this last section of the card here. Um, not only do I get the awesome abilities of this location, but I also get 40 points at the end of the game, which is significant. Um, it is pretty challenging though to be able to raise uh, raise yourself up through the ranks uh, in order to get to those higher levels of these cards over here. So, um, like I said, on Nick's turn, he can either add meeples over here, he can pick up one of these cards over here, um, he can go to one of these locations here if he has the requisite number of meeples and resources and that kind of stuff, or he could just recruit a um, extra spy from his um, reserve and put it into his active pool. Um, once we've each taken a turn, we are going to, um, I'm going to pass the first player marker over to Nick, so he'll be the first player in the next round. We're going to slide any cards um, necessary in to fill this in, uh, and then it will be, it'll be the next round. Now we are going to continue to play rounds with these cards here until we've completely run out of cards over here. Once we've run out of cards over here, then we'll create a new sort of draft row right here. Um, and we will continue to play turns and, um, and rounds and things like that until there's not enough cards left in this deck to create the next draft row that we need for the next round. Once that happens, the end of the game is going to be triggered. Um, we'll add up all of our points across um, multiple sources, uh, and whoever has the most points wins. And also, once these, once our first draft row is all, all extinguished, we have the opportunity to do treaties. Yeah, that's right. So what happens is we continue using the same card row until all these cards are gone, right? So in the first round, maybe I select this card and I acquire it. Maybe Nick does this one and he acquires it. That means the next time that we would um, look at cards to purchase, we, we would be able to purchase these three right here. Maybe again, Nick does this one, I do this one, we scoot this up. Maybe this time I select this and Nick does something else. Uh, and then we're at this position here. Um, again, maybe Nick selects this one and I do something else. Then we have these two left. Nick takes one and I take one and there's nothing left in the row, right? At this point in the game, what's gonna happen next is, is we're going to be able to fill in a new draft row and start sort of like a new round. But before we do that, we each have an opportunity to play one of these sort of secret objective cards that we have in our hand. Um, and these are pretty powerful cards, but they can take quite a bit to pull off as well. So you have to meet um, specific conditions for each card and um, they'll they'll give you some either really powerful one-time use ability um, or they'll give you some end of game scoring um, criteria that only you get to meet right so in the last game we played um, I had one where um, if I had a certain type of this card right here if I had uh, these purple cards um, then I got additional points for every purple card that I had. And because I was the only player who had that, that particular treaty card, uh, then I was the only player who could score for those cards in that way. Um, so what happens is, like I said, we draft all these cards out. Um, we have a, an opportunity to play a treaty card. Um, and then we would refill the draft row and we would continue playing. Uh, and we would play until we no longer have enough cards to refill the draft row when, when that would be necessary and then the game would end. In uh, the refilling of the draft row, there is a chance that we might encounter 
uh, a world war. There are two world war cards in this deck right here. Um, and if we were to um, pull one of those when we were filling our draft row, we would set it aside and we would um, finish filling in our draft row. But then for the remainder of that sort of round where we have, we're, we're working with those cards from that draft row, excuse me, uh, we would have to work under the conditions of a, a, a world war that would sort of be raging while we're playing those rounds. Um, and the world wars make it um, just a little bit different to try to pull off these um, sort of objectives here. So these are different things that you can try to, to rank up in the game that will give you um, special abilities and, and it will help you to um, do what you need to do maybe a little bit easier or a, a little bit cheaper than normal. Uh, but in order to actually um, acquire those abilities, you have to send your workers to them and you usually have to have or even pay sometimes resources in order to do that. Well, when the world wars are in play, we actually have a slightly adjusted set of costs um, to be able to send uh, workers to these locations. So um, it would cost, uh, I believe it is more workers, but fewer resources in order to send people there. Um, or and, fewer symbols. Yeah, yeah. So, so normally in order to send people to these, you'd have to um, have the the icons down here right so in order to send someone to this right here i would just have to spend a worker on my turn and then i could i could add someone to this right here right and then i would gain this ability for the remainder of the game if i wanted to sort of increase the rank of this person if i wanted him to to move up here i would have to spend two workers and i'd have to have one of these blue symbols uh in my my uh played cards and then i could move this guy up well, when we're playing with the world wars in place, it costs an additional worker to rank up. So if I wanted to move from here to here, it would normally cost me three workers. Well, if there was a world war raging, I'd actually have to spend four workers, but I would need one fewer symbol. So I'd only have to have one of the blue symbols uh, in order to actually move up over there. Um, and like I said, there's only two of those World War cards, um, and they will, they'll come out randomly. They're just kind of shuffled into the deck. They'll come out randomly. Um, there is a slight chance that they might come out at the same time, and if they do, then their effects are compounded. Um, so it costs uh, even more um, of your workers, but even fewer of the resources to be able to um, move people up on the, the ranks over here. Um, so yeah, that's that. Um, there's a few other things. There are ghost agents, which are special tokens that you can um, use as like kind of, uh, they'll get you a little further in the game, but they're sort of like one time use, right? Um, there are special um, interactions between some of the cards and that kind of thing. But for the most part, uh, it is a card drafting and worker placement style game with a pretty um, interesting theme, which uh, they've implemented really, really well in the game. It really it feels pretty heavy while you're playing this uh, because it just, I don't know, to us, it just really feels like they did a great job capturing this theme. Uh, and after Which was playing, a little stressful at times. Yeah, like, oh, okay. Yeah, sometimes it can be a little uh, bit stressful. It's, a little you know, too much. Yeah, it's all about, you know, establishing this new world order and um, there's a lot of uh, human suffering that comes with, with that sort of thing. So it's a little bit heavy of a theme, but it, they're very, um, uh, they've been very definitive about, you know, this is a, uh, a fictional universe and these are fictional events. This is like an alternative history sort of thing, you know. Um, so we will try to keep that in mind as we play. Should we give it a try, Nick? Yes. Let's right. go ahead and jump in to a deep state and we'll come back to y'all midway through the game. So yeah, let's get to it. Toodles. Welcome back, Meeple people, and hello, Sarah. Hi there. So, how's it going in Deep State? Um, so I'd say we're probably a little bit more than halfway through. 
Um, we have, we have just have a little bit of cards left, um, but we've just encountered our first world war. So it's still ongoing as we complete this round right here. Um, under the conditions of the world war, it is um, a little bit, the cost of um, moving up on these projects over here is a little bit different. Um, so Nick, I think you took advantage of that, right? And you moved up yeah, on a project? Yeah, I uh, moved up over here on the Deep State okay. World Domination Project. Um, I could use the World War to move up on my Unified Nations project, um, but it's been determined that um, there are there there's no way for me to move past the sort of like level three over here. Uh, because there are not going to be enough icons uh, left for me to move past that. And um, level four is where the points are. So um, level four, if you can get to level four, you get 20 points. If you can get to level five, you get 40 points. Um, I was, I'd kind of pitted my entire strategy on selecting one project and, and really trying to rank up on that project. Um, but there's just, there's not going to be enough cards for me to do that. And I'm kind of frustrated about it. Um, but we'll see if that's going to cost me the game or not. It, since I learned that I'm not going to be able to, um, sort of rank up into a point scoring area in that project, I've just kind of said, screw it. I'm going to just try other things. Uh, and since then I've just been accumulating points, trying to, um, get, points so that I can hopefully, um, you know, overcompensate for, or at least compensate for, uh, not being able to, to score points on that project. Um, and because that was the only project I was focusing on, uh, there's no way for me to, at this point in the game, there's no way for me to level up any other projects to a scoring condition. Um, so, uh, I've kind of screwed myself on, on the projects and the points that I could have potentially earned from completing a project. Um, so yeah, a little frustrated with the way that this one's going. Um, but we'll see. We'll just see what happens. What, how's it going over there for you, Nick? So, You've been able to complete a lot of treaties. Yeah, I have, uh, I've been able to do a lot of treaties, some through, uh, since I'm doing the deep state uh, condition, they let me pull out trees and then meet them without meeting the condition, which is getting me some points and some abilities. And then I've been sacrificing a lot of, to do all that, I've been sacrificing a lot of point cards to kind of, because they have the Illuminati symbol, and then I just throw them in there and all of a sudden I'm just, you know, I'm making it work. I was going to say, I think it's working for you though, because um, you have had to get rid of uh, a bit, a bit to pull off those cards, but, um, but I think like you've accumulated some points and yeah. some... Yeah, and not all the treaties were from sacrificing. Some of them I did, I, yeah. I was able to meet. I feel like um, that's an area where uh, I'm also not doing very well. Um, you start the game with four treaties uh, and all four of mine required symbols that were going to be really, really challenging to get. Um, so I just ignored them uh, because it felt like I could either I could either go over here to the deep state project um, like Nick did and sacrifice Illuminati symbols from my hand um, to get new uh, treaty cards. Um, but I didn't really want to do that because then I'm letting go of points over here for potential points over there. Um, but maybe at this point, that's what I should have done since um, my other strategies are not going to pay out the way that I was hoping they would. Um, but I guess we'll just see. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and jump right back up into Deep State by Crowdy Games. And we will tell you guys at the end who is the winner and the loser and how we feel about the game. All right, we'll see you guys in a sec. Toodles!
Welcome back, Meeple people, and hello, Sarah. Hi there. So how did the game go? I lost by one point. One point. I thought you won too. I was like, man, you got so much more points than I did, but then I squeezed it out by one little point. I wasn't sure that I had more points than you, but um, I thought I, I didn't think realize I was, it was that close yeah. either. So yeah, I didn't realize it was that close. I uh, was trying real hard on this deep state. Uh, objective and I got to the master of the world cool master of the world all shall play board games <laughs> that is the currency monopoly money is the currency now <laughs> uh, so yeah so it was pretty tight game it was um, I felt like I had to stay on my toes the whole time because yeah. like I said at the mid game I was really attempting to Nick sort of spread out a little bit and I was like I'm gonna keep most of my eggs in one basket and try really hard to push this up as hard as I can. Um, but unfortunately, it just could not happen in this game. Um, and in addition to that, I was having a really hard time getting um, uh, these treaty cards. I was getting treaty cards that like I, I wasn't going to be able to, to make it happen. Um, not easily, anyway. So I was trying to figure out how I could maybe come up with like an alternative strategy. Um, and what I ended up doing was just like just getting as many point cards as I could um, as cheaply as I could in an attempt to um, maybe try to mitigate not being able to get some of those higher point things that I knew that Nick was probably going to be able to achieve. Uh, and in the end, I'm pleased to see how tight of a game it was, um, especially because Nick and I went in, in kind of opposite directions. Um, so it's nice to see that the game was still pretty tight, even though I felt like I was kind of foundering the whole time. Uh, what did you think, Nick? Um, I, it was, it was alright. I, I'm, I'm not real a fan of the theme, I think, in today's climate and, uh, state of the world. It just was, like, too, too, uh, too close for comfort. It is pretty heavy theme. And so I was kind of like, ah! Yeah, it's a pretty... Pretty challenging theme sometimes, um, and I feel like they did a really good job with um, with really making the theme um, very prevalent throughout the game. So yeah. if it's a theme that you like, then you'll be really immersed in it. Or you don't mind, like it's 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 yeah. set in an alternate universe. It's not like you know they're pulling people from history or anything like that, but. Uh, it's just... But it is pretty heavy. Yeah, there's and a, it wasn't... There's a lot of, like, you know, unrest and, and human suffering that's occurring throughout this game. And... Um, we're kind of like, well, that's kind of what's going on a little bit right now. And we're like, yeah. Ah. Yeah, there's, uh, there's like, riots on one of the cars. And um, we live near Raleigh, North Carolina, where there have actually been a few riots this year uh, and last year. And um, some of them have gotten violent. Um, and it's just... It does hit a little close to home, um, especially because Nick is in law enforcement and he has had to be at some of those riots. Um, so it's... I've just been also in just government roles and it's just kind of like I've seen some of this and I'm just like, uh, not like the really Hollywood stuff, just, you know, brass at the table or brass at your door and just like, you know, just always having to, you know, answer some of these people and it's like, I, I don't want to be reminded of all this. I came to play games. <laughs> But the game, it's it works. It's just the theme is just pretty heavy-handed, and uh, well, and I just... think it is a heavy theme too. Yeah, right? not oh, yeah. only is it like very, very permeated throughout the game, but it's also it's also just a pretty heavy theme in general. Even though it is supposed to be sort of like a fantasy, you know, alternative history, alternate universe type yeah. thing, um, it is still a pretty heavy theme to deal with. Um, and I think if you don't mind. Um, this this sort of thing then you'll probably really enjoy it because um because it is so saturated with the theme um uh but if if it if it might bother you at all to have such a heavy theme um then maybe avoid this one but if it wouldn't then definitely if it seems like something you'd like give it a try because it's um uh, it's very challenging not just as a competitive experience but it's it's one of those games where you really feel um, like a personal challenge. I really felt like a personal challenge. I, I was concerned about Nick and what he was doing, but <clears throat> really I was just trying to figure out how to make my situation work the best for me, right? Um, so very challenging game, I think, especially, um, well, well, I won't say especially, but I think for us, we've only played a two-player game, and it seems like a two-player game is really, really tight. Now, there are 
more cards you'd add for higher player counts. Um, and I'm not exactly sure um, how that would change things to have more players at the table, but I did feel like this game was really, really tight. If you lost even sometimes one of the things that you needed, then it could, it could send your entire plan into the garbage and you'd have to kind of pivot to something else. Um, so if you like uh, games where you have to kind of just like work with what you're given sort of thing, um, if you like card drafting, if you like, um, I would say, kind of like set collection and engine building to a certain extent, if you like any of that um, and the theme on this one doesn't put you off, I would say give it a try. Um, I would say one other uh, sort of criticism or critique that um, I have about this one is that there doesn't seem to be a lot of representation here. Um, there, it's, it's mainly white people. Even in situations where it should like be um, pe people of a different race or color, uh, um, it, it's just a lot of white folks and a lot of men, um, a lot of white males. Um, and even so, when it went to women, it was pretty stereotypical and it was like yeah. blonde haired, big boobs. Yeah, yeah it's like, just, ah. so there's not, there doesn't seem to be like very much representation here, which is a little unfortunate, um, especially because this is, this is a global sort of environment, right? They had, they really had, um, an even greater opportunity than usual, I think, to include people of, you know, every race, color, creed, you know, um, that kind of thing. And it just seems pretty whitewashed. Um, yeah. I mean, not to just keep bragging on that point, but I mean, this character right here, I think was supposed to be, uh, Indian descent. Yeah. And most likely Middle Eastern. It just looks totally whitewashed. And I mean, yeah, I just, you call it, we see, call it, Call it as we see it, and that's just what our opinions of uh, what we feel about deep state and inclusion. So, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. But yeah, this was our vlog on deep state. We hope you all enjoyed it. Check it out if it has interested you. And yeah, we'll catch you guys in our next vlog. Don't forget to like and subscribe so you can stay up to date on all of our content. Well, until next time, toodles!